Right, well, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, as David says, I'd like to talk about some uh, automorphy lifting theorems today, namely some strengthenings of uh, some existing automorphy lifting theorems. Um, today I'd like to present a strengthening of one theorem in particular, so let me begin by stating that. I think I'll just introduce some notation first. Uh, so I want to have uh, an imaginary CM extension, uh, f over f plus, uh, and I'm going to want to have uh, an isomorphism, iota, between an algebraic closure of QL and the complex numbers. Uh, I'll take a prime L. Uh, and let me suppose, for example, that I have pi, uh, a regular algebraic conjugate self-dual cuspidal uh, automorphic representation of DLN of the Adele's over F. Uh, so as you've seen already in this situation, we can now associate uh, a representation, which I'll call R L pi, uh, of the absolute Galois group of F with image in GLN of QL bar. Now, an automorphy lifting theorem is a kind of converse result that allows us to start off with a Galois representation, and in some circumstances uh, show that it arises from such a pi. Um, so here's an example of such a theorem. Uh, this is due uh, mostly to Taylor, building on work of uh, Clazell, Harrison, Taylor. But I think the deduction in this level of generality is due to Gerberoff. OK, so we need some hypotheses. So let me suppose that L is uh, large compared to N, uh, and that I'm starting off with a representation R, continuous rep representation from the absolute Galois group of F uh, to GLN uh, of QL bar. And let me suppose that the following hypotheses are verified. Um, so the standard ones first, I'll want my R to be uh, unramified almost everywhere. Uh, it should be uh, conjugate self-dual up to twist. Uh, so in that, this case, this means that R, con uh, R conjugated, where uh, C in gal of F over F plus is the non-trivial element. Uh, this R conjugated should be isomorphic to the dual of R uh, twisted 1 minus n times by the cyclotomic character. Uh, let me suppose furthermore that this representation is crystalline. So uh, at every place V of F dividing L, I want R restricted to uh, the local Galois group to be crystalline. And let's suppose that it has Hodge Tate weights. Uh, 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1. OK. So almost done with the statement of the theorem at this point. Uh, the fourth hypothesis, perhaps the most important one, is that this representation should be uh, residually modular. So I want there to exist uh, pi prime, again, uh, regular algebraic conjugate self-dual and cuspidal, uh, such that when I look at the, uh, sorry, uh, an automorphic representation pi prime, which is of weight 0, uh, such that when I look at the semi-simplification of the reduction of R, uh, this should be isomorphic to the same for the representation uh, RL pi. I think I'll call it pi rather than pi prime to begin with. OK. And two final hypotheses. Uh, I want L to be unramified in F. Uh, and I would like this representation R bar when restricted to the absolute Galois group of F join an L-threative unity to have big image. OK. And the theorem is that with these six hypotheses, I can deduce that uh, R itself is automorphic. So R arises from another uh, cuspidal automorphic, sorry, a regular algebraic conjugate self-dual cuspidal representation, uh, pi prime, which I went right. OK. Um, so that's the theorem. I'll, I'll define this notion of big image for you uh, later in the talk. Um, what I want to discuss is the strength. Sorry, question. What do you mean by weight zero? What corresponds to the New York state weights you have? Um, so that means that the infinitesimal character of pi should be trivial. So your question. Yeah. Uh, yes, so RL pi will have the same Hodge Tate weights as uh, R here. Um, so yes, I'd like to discuss the strengthening of this theorem, where we can replace uh, this technical hypothesis big image with one which may be more familiar to you, especially if you've studied modularity lifting theorems with GL2, namely that this representation, R bar restricted to uh, uh, this Galois group, should be irreducible. OK. 
Uh, and I suppose, in that case, I should add myself to the list of authors. OK. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to give a sketch of the proof of this theorem and indicate how, by modifying the, uh, the way in which you apply the Taylor-Wiles method, uh, you can deduce a slightly stronger result, so weakening this hypothesis here. Before I do that, I should say a word about why you'd be interested in such a mild strengthening. Um, well, most applications of this kind of result at the moment come from potential automorphy. Uh, and now key, a key method there is that of starting off with a representation like R and then tensoring it, for example, with, uh, for example, a representation which is induced from a character. Um, now, the uh, notion of big image, which I haven't defined yet, but we'll do so later, is very unstable under that kind of operation. Um, this is why uh, in earlier papers you'll have seen hypotheses such as M big. Uh, that's designed so that when you take an R bar like this and tensor it with something else, you can still have a big image afterwards. Whereas this hypothesis here, just that R bar is irreducible, uh, is a lot more um, amenable to that kind of, kind of operation. Okay. So let me begin by uh, setting up a sketch of the proof of this theorem. OK, uh, so we can assume after a soluble base change that uh, f over s plus, f plus satisfies a few more hypotheses. Uh, let me suppose that it's unramified at every finite place. Uh, let me suppose that if uh, v is a place of f plus uh, above which either of these two representations is ramified, uh, let's say r or r l pi is ramified, Uh, this should imply that V actually splits in F. And the third most important hypothesis is that there should exist a unitary group uh, which I'll call G over F plus, satisfying two further, further hypotheses. Uh, first off, uh, should be uh, definite at every infinite place. So perhaps I should say, uh, for every place v dividing infinity, uh, g of the completion of f plus at v is isomorphic to un. Uh, and secondly, that um, for every finite place, uh, the restriction of f, so the restriction of g to that place uh, is quasi-split. Um, so these hypotheses all together allow us to remove, remove obstructions to base changing from GLN to this unitary group G. OK. Um, so I'm going to begin by introducing uh, some spaces of automorphic forms which we'll be working with. Uh, so let me take uh, U uh, to be an open compact subgroup of G of the finite adults. Um, and let me take also k to be a finite subfield of QL bar, by which I mean finite over QL. And let me take O to be its ring of integers. Um, so with this data, I can define an integral model of uh, a space of automorphic forms on the group G, uh, which for the purpose of this talk can just be taken to be the following. So I'll call it S of U comma O to be this space of functions uh, from uh, the following double coset space. G of the finite adels, modded out by the rational points on the left and U on the right, set of functions from that space to O. Now, in this case, this is a finite set, so there's no need to talk about any kind of topology or uh, additional representation of G or anything like that. OK. Uh, now, I also want to introduce a Hecker algebra. Uh, how will I do that? Uh, well, I'll use the following trick. Um, so let's suppose that I have uh, V a place of f plus, which splits as w, w conjugate uh, in f. So in that situation, I can identify uh, g of uh, fv plus with uh, gln uh, of fw. I'll choose such an identification. Uh, and if under this identification, uv corresponds to, uh, let's say, gln of the ring of integers in that field, fw. I have access to the usual unramified Hecker operators on GLN. Um, so we have uh, operators, let me call them TWI, 
are acting on this space. Uh, so these are just the usual unramified Hecker operators. Uh, the double coset operators, if you like. So for example, uh, TWI would be the double coset operator, uh, GLN, OFW, and then the matrix, uh, let me just say pi, pi i times, and then GLN, OFW. So if n was 2, then T1 would be TP, and T2 would be SP, I guess, up to scalar. Uh, and then I introduced the Hecker algebra, T of u brackets O, which is just the O subalgebra uh, of the endomorphism algebra of the space of modular forms, uh, generated by uh, TWI, uh, where I goes from 1 to n, and TWN inverse uh, for every place W of this form. Uh, so a place lying above a place of F plus, which splits, uh, and at which U is a uh, maximal compact. OK. Um, so as I mentioned, now uh, by results of Lebesgue, we can base change pi to the group G. Uh, and we'll obtain, for suitable choice of U, um, an automorphic representation of G with a U fixed vector. Um, so in that way, pi will give rise to a, a homomorphism. Let me call it phi sub pi from this Hecker algebra uh, to QL bar. Uh, and I'll take m inside this Hecker algebra uh, to be the maximal ideal containing this kernel. Uh, containing the kernel of phi sub pi. Uh, and at this point, we can introduce the Hecker algebra with which we'll be working. Uh, it'll be uh, t of u comma o localized at m. Um, now, if I consider other homomorphisms uh, from this Hecker algebra to QL bar, I'll get other automorphic representations. Uh, and then again, I can base change back to GLN and use this association to obtain more Gala representations. Um, I don't want to go, in, go into the details, but let me just write that. Given a homomorphism phi uh, from this space to QL bar, uh, we can obtain uh, a Galois representation R sub phi, which goes from GF to GLN of QL bar, um, which satisfies uh, a list of properties which I won't mention. But the most important one for us is that uh, the reduction of this representation will be isomorphic to the reduction of R bar, or if you want, uh, RL pi. OK. Um, now, an important point is that we can glue all of these represent representations together, these phi's and phi sub pi, uh, to obtain a representation which I'll call R mod uh, from GF to GLN, not of QL bar, but of uh, the Hecker algebra itself. Uh, a continuous representation which will satisfy two properties. Uh, the first one is that for any phi as above, Uh, we have uh, phi composed with R mod uh, is isomorphic to the original R phi. And finally, if I look at uh, R mod modulo the maximal ideal, so mod m, uh, I recover again the original residual representation. Um, is everyone happy? Um, uh, I think so, yes. Um, I, I, I just referred to Gerberoff. I, I, I myself just referred to Gerberoff. I don't know the precise details at that point. OK. Um, all right. Uh, so th those are the Hecker algebras and the Galois representations, which we'll be using. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, some universal deformation rings for Galois representations. And then we'll be able to phrase the proof of this theorem uh, as a proof of a certain R equals T theorem. Okay. 
So before I do that, I'll need to introduce some more notation. Um, so I think I want to take uh, S to be a finite set of primes of F plus. Uh, all of which split uh, in F, uh, such that my representations R and RL pi uh, are unramified outside S. OK. Uh, and then for each uh, V in S, uh, I'll choose a place uh, W of F above V. And I'll call this set, uh, let's say, S tilde, the set of these places W, uh, one chosen for each V in S. OK. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do now is define a, a global deformation problem. So I can, def uh, I can then define uh, a global deformation ring classifying deformations of that particular type. So I'll choose uh, for each w in s tilde, a local deformation problem uh, dw. Uh, and I'll write curly s uh, for the set of these local deformation problems them having been chosen. Now, I'm going to elide several details at this point, because I don't want to get into the te technicalities of uh, the precise definitions of these objects. In particular, I won't tell you what I mean by a local deformation problem. Let me just give you an example. Uh, so if, uh, let's say, V divides L, or let me say if W divides L, uh, W will lie in S tilde. And then I'll take my D sub W to be uh, the set of liftings uh, of R bar restricted to local Gallagher group at W, which are crystalline. Uh, and have Hodge Tate weights uh, 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1. Now, if I'm working over kind of an, an Artinian O algebra, I'll have to interpret this in, this, in the sense of Fontaine Lefay theory, um, but that's not really a problem. Um, so, if, you, if you're not familiar with the details here, you should just think of dw as being uh, uh, a set of conditions which uh, a local lifting of the residual representation restricted to the local Galois group might satisfy. OK. Uh, so can you just uh, specify a list that means in terms of deformation ring or as a concrete representation to GLM? Yeah. Um, so uh, the best way to define uh, a local deformation problem, I think, would be as a functor from uh, the category of uh, Artinian O algebras with given residue field to sets. So the point is, is it the representation or the representation of two isomorphisms? Uh, and it would just be the set of possible liftings as homomorphisms to GLN. So I don't mod out by concrete morphisms. I don't mod out by, by isomorphisms, yes. Uh, yes, we'll come back to that point in a minute. OK. So uh, given this data, I can define a local deformation ring. Um, so it will be a complete uh, local O algebra, uh, which I'll call uh, our univ sub s, which classifies uh, now deformations, so liftings up to equivalence, uh, let me say r tilde of r, r bar, uh, which satisfy the following properties. Um, so the first one is that uh, r tilde should be unramified outside s. Uh, or let's say S tilde. The second one uh, is that uh, R, R tilde should be conjugate self-dual. Uh, and the third one is that for every place W in S tilde, the restriction of the, of the deformation to the local Galois group should belong to the local deformation problem which we've described. Um, now, one big technicality which I'm sweeping under the rug at this point is how you make precise the notion that the lifting should be conjugate self-dual. Uh, at this point, one introduces uh, a group uh, curly G uh, and views uh, and just considers liftings which are valued in that group. But I don't want to discuss that here. 
Uh, so we'll just think of uh, deformations or liftings up to equivalence, which satisfy some kind of conjugate self-duality condition. Okay. All right. Um, so at this point, we have two maps from this ring. Uh, so for a suitable choice uh, of global deformation problem S, uh, both of my representations R and RL, pi will be of type S. So I'll have two morphisms uh, from this ring. Uh, one to Hecker algebra localized this maximal ideal. Let me call this capital phi. So this will classify uh, the representation R mod, which I've mentioned on the right-hand side blackboard here. Um, there'll be a second homomorphism, a little phi, uh, to O, which classifies the original representation R. Um, and now at this point, one can see that to prove this theorem here, uh, to show that R is automorphic, it suffices to show that this homomorphism in fact factors through capital phi. So again, to prove the, homo prove the theorem, it suffices to prove that little phi factors through capital phi. Um, now, uh, how you actually prove this, it, well, it depends on the particular situation. For example, if one could prove in R equals T theorem, uh, namely that capital phi was an isomorphism, that would follow immediately. Uh, in general, one can get by with a slightly weaker result, but we won't go into the specifics here. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. So at this point, we've reduced the proof of the theorem to a study of the, uh, the Taylor Wilds method, which is uh, a way of studying uh, this morphism phi here from R to T. Uh, and the strengthening of the theorem comes from a strengthening of the Taylor Wiles method, so I'll now discuss that. This will be a discussion of the Taylor Wiles method. So let me introduce some more auxiliary notation. Uh, I'll take T uh, inside S to be another finite set of primes. And I want uh, for every V dividing L, V to lie in T. And I'll consider S tilde again and the pullback of T to S tilde. And I'll define some more objects at this point. Um, so for every w and t tilde, I can consider rw, which will be the uh, ring classifying uh, lifts of r bar restricted to gfw uh, in d sub w. Um, so this is a universal lifting ring as opposed to a universal deformation ring. Uh, I write r loc the complete tensor product uh, over all w in t tilde of these local lifting rings. Uh, and I introduce one final object, um, uh, r sub s framed at t, which classifies uh, deformations uh, of r bar of type s. Uh, with the choice of framing uh, for each uh, w in t tilde. Um, so I, I add an analog of a choice of basis uh, at each place in t tilde. Uh, so this is related to the universal deformation ring in rather a simple way. So if I take curly T to be a power series ring over O in, uh, let's say, n squared times the number of elements in T 
variables. Uh, there's a non-canonical isomorphism between this framed deformation ring uh, and the universal deformation ring, completed tensor product with curly T. Uh, all, all of this taking place over O. Um, so if you like, you can view these extra variables as the framing variables. Um, now, what is the point of introducing uh, these additional framings? Well, we'd like to have a map from uh, the local lifting rings uh, to the universal deformation ring, uh, classifying the restriction of the universal global deformation to each local place. And now this can exist only when we include the additional data of a framing at each place in T. OK. So we have a diagram of rings that makes this ring an R log algebra. Uh, and then we still have a homomorphism from this ring to the Hecker algebra, uh, tensed up with uh, curly T. This homomorphism, of course, relying on a uh, the non-canonical choice that we made here. OK. <clears throat> All right. Um, so what is the point of that? Well, we want to be able to present the global deformation ring as a uh, quotient of the local deformation ring adjoints of formal variables. Um, and doing a, a standard tangent space calculation, we can find a surjection from uh, our local adjoin k variables, say, t on up to tk, uh, to the framed deformation ring, uh, where this number k of variables is given by the following formula. So it's the size of some dual Selma group with coefficients in the dual of the adjoint representation uh, minus and plus some other factors. And I'll call this number Q. Um, for the purpose of the following conversation. OK. So we're going to study the map from R to T in terms of presentations of this form. And this is where the, really the kind of key, idea, key idea of the taylor wiles argument in its current form comes in. So let me say what that is uh, and how I can use it to uh, deduce the proof of the theorem. So I'm going to um, suppose that I have special data of a particular kind, and then see how, given that data, I could get a proof of the theorem. Um, the description of the data is as follows. So for each positive integer n, uh, I want to augment my deformation problem. So I'll choose some places to add to s. Uh, let's say qn, and then I'll take places above them, sn tilde as before where the number of places in each of these sets, qn, should be equal to q, the size of this uh, dual Selma group here. OK. Uh, and I'll choose additional deformation problems, dw, uh, for each w in the set qn tilde. Um, then there'll be auxiliary Hecker modules and auxiliary Hecker algebras, uh, such that I have the following. So there should be a homomorphism from R log adjoin k formal variables uh, to the frame deformation ring of this new uh, auxiliary deformation problem, Sn, sorry, which I haven't added. Uh, let me add that here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no that's correct. Um, let me write out the, uh, the full description of the data, and then it should be clear. But I'll, I'll say again at, at that point otherwise. OK. Um, so I consider the global deformation ring, um, and I want to be able to present it uh, as a quotient of R log adjoining the same number of variables as before. But I need uh, some extra things to be satisfied. Um, so the first one is that uh, there should be uh, an abelian L group delta qn, which subjects onto z mod L to the n to the q. Uh, and this map uh, should be a homomorphism 
of, uh, let's say, O brackets delta QN algebras. Um, so by that I mean I should be able to specify algebra structures uh, of both of these rings over the group algebra here. And the natural homomorphism between them should then become a homomorphism of O brackets delta QN algebras. OK. Um, and the second requirement is that uh, S of QN should be uh, a free O brackets delta QN module with co-invariants uh, isomorphic to our original space and modular forms localized at our chosen maximal ideal. Um, so in the description of the data, we have uh, an extra places that forms the set Sn. Uh, and we also have auxiliary Hecker rings and Hecker modules. Uh, those are respectively T sub Qn and S sub Qn. And that the point is that those are somehow at additional level. And we, when we mod out by the additional level, we recover the uh, initial object, uh, namely this space here. OK. So uh, how can I use this data to deduce the theorem? So let me introduce, first off, an auxiliary ring. So this is just a power series ring over O in Q variables, uh, which I can write suggestively, if I want, as uh, the inverse limit over N of these group algebras. Uh, and what do you do? Well, you uh, patch the homomorphisms from uh, R infinity, which is defined to be uh, our loc adjoin k formal variables uh, down to the frame lifting ring, which then acts in the Hecker module. Uh, sorry, uh, SQN tends a hat up to T. Um, now, the idea is that uh, each of these Hecker modules here receives an action of uh, a ring that looks very much like this one here. Uh, and you'd like to be able to somehow glue those in parts of the limit and get a module with an action of this power series ring instead. Uh, now, patching uh, is the word one uses to refer to that process, which inevitably requires some kind of choices and intricate arguments, uh, which I won't give here. I just want to describe uh, the result of that argument. Uh, so having patched, you obtain oops, an R infinity module uh, H sub infinity, which should be viewed as kind of a limiting object for this sequence of framed Hecker modules here, uh, with the following properties. So the first one is that H infinity also receives uh, a, a, a commuting action of uh, S sub infinity tensor hat with curly T. Uh, and with respect to this action, H infinity is free over that ring. Um, so that property comes from passing to limit with respect to property 2 here. OK. What else do I need to happen? Uh, well, it should also be the case that this action of S infinity tensor hat T uh, factors through a homomorphism to R infinity. OK. And one final compatibility requirement. I want uh, H infinity uh, tensor over uh, R infinity with the original universal deformation ring uh, to give me 
uh, the original Hecker module that I was looking at. OK. So that's kind of compatibility requirement. OK. Uh, and now, at this point, we have everything that we need to prove the theorem. Um, so let me quickly show you how to do that. Uh, it comes from the following kind of dimension estimate, which people sometimes refer to as the numerology of the Taylor Wilde argument. Um, so we calculate that the dimension of our infinity, uh, which is equal to uh, q plus n squared times the number of elements in t plus 1, by the definition of the integer k, which we, we introduced earlier. Uh, this is greater than or equal to the depth uh, of h infinity as an R infinity module. Uh, if you're not familiar with depth, that's a concept from commutative algebra. It refers to the maximal length uh, of an h infinity regular sequence in R infinity. Uh, I won't give the precise definition, but the important point is, as, a, uh, as the length of a sequence of elements in that ring, it can only decrease when you pass to a subring. Uh, so this is greater than or equal to the depth of h infinity as an s-infinity tentahat curly t module. But then uh, h infinity is free over that ring. So then the depth here is equal to the dimension. So this is the dimension of s-infinity tensor curly hat t, which almost by definition is equal to q plus n squared times the number of limits in t plus 1. OK. Uh, now this implies that equality holds. Uh, and in particular, the dimension of R infinity is equal to the depth of H infinity as an R infinity module. And then by standard phantom commutative algebra, uh, this implies that the support of H infinity uh, inside the spectrum of R infinity, well, by definition, it's a closed subset, but it must in fact be a union of uh, irreducible components. OK. Um. So what does that give you? Well, let me just treat uh, an example case. Um, so one thing that can happen, for example, is uh, if our loc is itself uh, irreducible. So this is equivalent to each of the individual uh, um, local lifting rings being irreducible, which is something that happens in the minimal case, for example. Uh, this will imply that our infinity, is our infinity is irreducible, and therefore the support uh, of page infinity uh, has to be equal to the whole spectrum of the ring R infinity. Um, and since support behaves well with respect to uh, uh, closed embeddings, this implies that the support of the original space of modular forms uh, as a module over the universal deformation ring is, in fact, equal to the whole spectrum of the universal deformation ring. Uh, and this implies, for example, an isomorphism the Hecker algebra, which is a priori reduced, and the reduction of the universal deformation ring. And that's enough to deduce uh, modularity lifting theorem in the minimal case. Uh, in general, in particular in this situation, more is required, but I don't want to go, in the, go into the details of that here. OK. Um, so that's a sketch of the Taylor, Taylor Wilde's argument, uh, given this auxiliary data on the right-hand side of the blackboard here. So what I want to do now is say how you construct that data and how by uh, Changing the argument slightly, you can obtain data of this form in a slightly more general situation.
right. So this is uh, how to construct other sets, uh, Sn, and all the rest. Um, so first off, we want to kind of add extra ramification to our deformation problem, curly S, in such a way that we can still write the universal deformation ring as a quotient of uh, our loc, so that should be our subloc, uh, adjoin k variables, where k is the same k as before. Now, uh, calculation with a variant of uh, Weyl's order characteristic formula uh, implies that we can do this uh, as, as long as the following uh, conditions are met. Uh, so we're OK if, uh, first off, the jules selmer group of this larger augmented problem, Sn, viewed as a subgroup of the original jules selmer group, which had dimension q, uh, this must be 0. OK. Uh, and the second requirement is that if I, uh, let's say, define uh, curly LW for each W in QN tilde, tilde uh, inside H1 of local Garner group co coefficients in the adjoint representation, uh, so let's say that this is the tangent space to my augmented problem DW. Uh, so this is what people sometimes refer to as the local deformation space. Uh, we should have that the dimension of this is exactly one more than the dimension of the space of unramified co-cycles, sorry, uh, cohomology classes. So this is the dimension of H1 unramified with coefficients in local Galois group plus one. OK. Um, So let me first describe uh, how Clizel Harris Taylor obtained primes uh, of this form and satisfying these criteria on the right hand side, uh, and how that leads to the definition of big image. So this is the constructor, construction from uh, Clizel Harris Taylor. OK. So we start off with uh, a cocycle phi, uh, which gives a cohomology class in the dual Selmer group. And we're going to try to augment our deformation problem in such a way that this uh, co-cycle, or rather its class, does not survive to the uh, dual Selmer group of the enlarged deformation problem. OK. Um, so given such a thing, we'll uh, augment the deformation problem as follows. So we'll choose a place, uh, let's say, Q uh, outside of S. Uh, which is split in F. And let's say it splits as uh, U times U conjugate. And let's suppose that uh, our bar, when evaluated at the Frobenius uh, at the place U, has the following form. So I'll just say it's diagonal with these eigenvalues alpha rai. Uh, and I want alpha n to be a multiplicity one eigenvalue. So it should be not equal to. Uh, alpha 1 all the way up to alpha n. So then I choose, or maybe I define, uh, the, the deformation d sub u at this place uh, to be the set of lifts of the following form. So lifts of the form. Uh, almost have enough room. So I want to take lifts of the form, let's say, r tilde equals phi 1 down to phi n, where uh, first off, phi 1 up to phi n minus 1 are unramified characters. Uh, and uh, phi i prob u bar is the eigenvalue alpha i. 
So th th these are just unramified characters lifting the ones already on the diagonal. And uh, secondly, I want phi n to be allowed to be ramified. OK. Um, so this deformation problem certainly satisfies the requirement that the local deformation space grows by only one in dimension. Because the only ramification I'm allowing is uh, this single character here. OK. Uh, oh, yes, sorry, that, that's also essential. Um, so I'll require that Q is congruent to one mod L. Thank you. OK. Um, sorry, what, what did I want to say next? Um, so I should say also how um, this gives rise to an action of the L group, or of a, a abelian L group on the uh, local deformation ring. Well, we have this character phi n uh, in the universal lifting. And this will go from inertia at q to the units in the frame deformation ring, say. Uh, let's say Sn once we've chosen enough primes. Uh, and you can show that this will factor through, well, first the map via local class field theory to the residue field at the place q. Uh, and then to the maximal uh, L power order quotient of that. Uh, and because we choose q to be congruent to 1 modulo L to the n, uh, this is uh, an L group. Or rather, it, it has as a quotient z mod L to the n. And what, what, when you choose a bunch of different primes and take the product of the characters, uh, you get the action on the local deformation ring, which I required in the, the first part of the data over here. OK. Um, so we, we have primes. We have a, an augmented deformation problem. Um, we have an action on the deformation ring. Uh, the one thing we need in order to fill the requirements I mentioned before is to be able to kill co-cycles of the dual Selma group. So I need to show that the original co-cycle that I chose doesn't survive to the dual, dual Selma group of the enlarged deformation problem. Um, and how do you do that? Well, uh, uh, an elementary calculation shows that uh, cohomology class phi uh, will not survive uh, to this dual Selma group. Uh, let me say uh, S union uh, du pup contained in the original dual Selma group, uh, provided that uh, the following element is non-zero. So I want uh, pi sub alpha n composed with phi evaluated at uh, the Frobenius at u composed with i sub alpha n to be non-zero, where I should define pi and i. Um, So pi sub alpha n uh, is the projection uh, to the alpha n eigenspace. And i sub alpha n is the inclusion uh, of the alpha n eigenspace. OK. Uh, and to pin, the, pin these both down uniquely, I should say that they are uh, equivariant with respect to R bar evaluated at the Frobenius at U. So these are equivariant. OK. All right. Um, so the co-cycle will not survive, provided that this condition is met. Uh, and how do we show that this condition is met? Well, this is where we start to need auxiliary hypotheses, namely the hypothesis of big image. So primes uh, Q of this form uh, can be found uh, using the Chibota of density theorem uh, provided uh, that the subgroup, uh, let's say, R bar of G Absolute Galois group of F adjoined zeta L 
contained in GLN of FL bar is big. OK, so I'll define big for you. Yes? Uh, here, sorry. Yeah. This should certainly be B phi, because this is a condition that. Uh, so phi is the a particular fixed co cycle that contributes a class in the dual Selma group. Yes. OK. All right. So let's give, give a definition. We say that a subgroup H of DLN of FL bar, uh, let me say a finite subgroup. Uh, is big if the following conditions are verified. Uh, so first off, I want there to be no global sections in uh, at zero of V, where V is the natural and dimensional space which H is acting on. So this should be zero. And I want there to be no cohomology in the following two spaces. First off, in at zero of V, and secondly, in uh, the trivial representation. OK. Uh, so these three conditions are fairly harmless. Uh, it's the fourth, the final one related to, uh, where are we? Oh, yes, uh, to this condition here, which is the real killer. Uh, make sure, let me make sure I get it right. So uh, for all uh, simple FL bar brackets H submodules, let's say W contained in uh, add zero of v. Uh, we want there to exist h and h and alpha, a multiplicity one eigenvalue uh, of h, uh, such that uh, pi sub alpha composed with w composed with i sub alpha is not equal to zero. And these are the uh, projections on and inclusions into the alpha eigenspace which are uh, H equivariant. OK. So that's how we can prove the theorem in the case where the residual image is big. Well, uh, now let me show you how you can modify this to allow a more general statement. Now, to save time, I think I'll just change what I wrote already. Um, so I'm still going to be considering primes Q, which are congruent to 1 modulo L, or L to the N, rather. Uh, but now, rather than looking just for primes such that the Frobenius has a multiplicity 1 eigenvalue, I'm going to allow eigenvalues of arbitrary multiplicity. I should just say now. Um, so let me say that alpha N minus K is equal to alpha n minus k plus 1, all the way up to alpha n, uh, but such that alpha n is not equal to any other eigenvalue of Frobenius. OK. Uh, and then again, we consider lifts which are diagonal. Um, so I consider uh, lifts which have characters on the diagonal uh, and Uh, I want lifts such that uh, phi 1 all the way up to phi n minus k minus 1 are unramified. So I'm leaving those eigenvalues which reduce down to alpha 1 all the way up to alpha n minus k minus 1 alone. Uh, and then these characters, uh, phi n minus k all the way up to phi n, may be ramified. Uh, but they must have identical restriction to inertia. Uh, so I want phi n minus k restricted to inertia to be equal to all the way up to phi n restricted to inertia. OK. Um, so I just allow a slightly more general deformation problem with this place. Um, now let's see. So in order to have the uh, local deformation space only grown one by dimension, well, uh, that requirement, requirement is certainly satisfied because uh, there's, only, there's a unique uh, degrees worth of uh, movement in the, in the uh, ramification here. 
So if I look at all the characters I get by restricting these to inertia, there's only one character because they all coincide. OK. Um, the action of this L group on the universal deformation ring is just defined in much the same way. Uh, so the only thing I have to worry about is making sure that I can still kill the dual co-cycle. So I still, still kill the co-cycle and make sure that it doesn't survive to the dual cell group. OK. Uh, and the same computation shows that rather than needing this to be non-zero, I just need, it, need the trace of this element to be non-zero, viewed as an endomorphism uh, of the space on which R bar is acting. OK. Um, so having made these changes to the argument, uh, I now get a different condition on the uh, residual representation. Rather than wanting the image to be big, again, I'll just change this, I think, uh, we uh, require it to satisfy a new definition uh, which we've named adequate. And the first three conditions are the same. I require these cohomology groups to vanish. Uh, and as you might be able to guess, uh, the fourth condition is the same, except instead of looking for a multiplicity one eigenvalue, I now allow eigenvalues alpha of arbitrary multiplicity. Uh, so I now just need any eigenvalue alpha of that form. All right, so that allows us to prove this theorem on the left-hand side when uh, the residual image, or rather the image of R bar restricted to the absolute Galois group of F adjoined zeta L, is adequate as opposed to big. Um, but I wrote down a different hypothesis here. Uh, I asked that it was just irreducible. Um, so one final piece of input is required, uh, namely a theorem that tells us uh, when we can expect uh, subgroups of GLN FL bar to be adequate. I think I shall state one more theorem and then call it a day. Um, so this is a theorem due jointly to uh, Goralnik, uh, Hetzig, Taylor, and myself. Uh, and it states the following. Um, so suppose that uh, L is bigger than 2m plus 1. Uh, and that H contained in GLN of FL bar uh, is a finite subgroup uh, and that H acts on its natural representation V irreducibly. Uh, this implies uh, that H is adequate. And this is all we need to compute, complete the proof of the uh, theorem on the left-hand blackboard. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.